before I begin a, a few of my comments, um, I want to address something that I think is on the mind of many of the students in particular here, especially those that are four-year, um, I should say, undergraduate students. I want to be very clear. I want to express my strong opposition to the UC's proposed tuition tax hike on all the students. I've made that very clear uh, with my conversations with the University of California President, Janet Napolitano, and I want to be very certain with all of the students that I do not support in no form, way, or shape, even incrementally, any tuition tax hike on our students. I think you know better than most uh, the value of education and the cost of education, because it's not just tuition or the exorbitant cost of books, but it's also something called life, which is the ability to pay the rent, the roof over your head, the ability to pay food, the ability to pay for your transportation cost as well. So I w hope that uh, we can work uh, together very closely uh, with the UC system, uh, with the state legislature, the state senate that I lead, as well as my colleague in the uh, state assembly, and with our governor. Now, I know that these are very difficult times for many of us and I have never been prouder to be a Californian. Now, politicians are prone. It doesn't make a difference if you're a Democrat or a Republican. Uh, we are prone to hyperbole. And I want to score the following. You know, I want to emphasize it and, and italicize it and bold it, if you will, and highlight it. These are very historic times in our nation. These are, in fact, very dangerous times in the United States of America. But California, I can tell you this, from education to the environment, from high wages to health care to human rights, California is proof positive that progressive values put into action improve the human condition. We are the innovation nation state, home to Hollywood and Silicon Valley, the best public university system in the world, and the lion's share of America's agricultural bounty. We are on the cusp of passing the United Kingdom to become the world's fifth largest economy. To put this in context, the largest economy in the world is the United States of America, in the aggregate. It is China, it is Japan, it is Germany. At teetering at number five, depending on the fluctuations of the sterling, the pound, it is the United Kingdom. And at number six, it is your great state, the state of California. And if you're remotely interested in rounding out the top ten, at number seven, it is France, and number eight, eight, it is Brazil, and number nine is a nation that's been in the news quite a bit and will be so for the foreseeable future. It is Russia. And number 10, it is Italy. So California's GDP, and for lack of a better economic measurement, I'll use GDP for right now, California's GDP is larger than that of Vladimir Putin's Russia. And I'll put this in context because it's very important. And now that the president has finally got up the courage to come visit the great state of California, he should know who we are and what we stand for. In California, we celebrate who we are. We celebrate our diversity. Now, whether your origins are French or Italian or English or Welsh or Scottish or German, whether they are from a nation in the continent of Africa, whether it's Mexican or Salvadorian or Central American, whether it's Chinese or Korean, in this great state, we celebrate our diversity. We don't ban it, we don't deport it, and we as sure as hell don't wall it off, not in a great state like California. We succeed because we're dreamers, not dividers. We succeed because we double down on lifting people up, not putting them down. In this state, we make public policy based on facts and based on science. We didn't grow into the world's sixth largest economy and the epicenter of innovation by spouting alternative facts or pseudoscientific nonsense. We don't govern by bigotry or gimmickry. You can't run a global economy on empty promises or stoking hatred and division. We know we can't afford to alienate our friends as well as our neighbors. Building walls and burning bridges will only leave us weak and isolated. We don't pit America against the world. In our great state, California, we surely don't pit Americans against each other. That doesn't help working families pay the bills. It doesn't make us safer or, in fact, bring back jobs. Here in California, we have a real plan to improve the human condition for every person that calls our state home. No matter who you are, no matter where you live, no matter who you love, no matter the hue of your skin, no matter who you, which God you pray to, no matter your legal status, 
The record speaks for itself. By nearly any objective measure, California is the beating heart of the American economy. And we're not going to allow one electoral aberration reverse generations of progress at the height of our historic diversity, our scientific advancement, our economic output, and our sense of global responsibility. Now, in recent history, no state legislative body in America has done more in more ways to improve everyday lives of so many people. We're working to expand access to quality education from preschool to college, to strengthen our social safety nets and rebuild our infrastructure so that we can have a strong, inclusive economy that's built to last. Last year, after decades of inaction, we passed a bipartisan solution to fix our crumbling transportation infrastructure and we finally overcame the gridlock and passed an ambitious package of bills to tackle our crippling shortage of affordable housing. Now, it won't be the end all. It's not the panacea, but it's one huge step forward so we can deal with this issue that drives so many Californians into poverty, which is a lack of supply, a lack of affordability. In recent years, we've also passed the strongest gun control legislation in America to make our communities safer because we don't take orders from the NRA and we know we can do better for our kids. We consistently lead the nation in job creation and we've added more than three million jobs since the end of the worst economic recession since the Great Depression. And since we adopted the ACA, the Affordable Care Act here in California, we have cut our uninsured rate by more than half. We're now at a historic low level of Californians without health insurance. We've done all this while also passing compassionate immigration policies to help hardworking families out of the shadows and into society. We've provided driver's license and health care for undocumented children and students, financial aid for dreamers, legal assistance for refugees and immigrants in detention, and we pass my measure. Senate Bill 54, the California Values Act, also known as the Sanctuary State Bill, to ensure California is not a cog in the president's deportation machine. We know that America is and always will be a nation of immigrants, and we welcome people of all walks of life. We can all agree that we do need comprehensive immigration reform. This is one thing across the spectrum, whether one is on the right or on the left or points in between. One thing that I think we can agree is that we have a broken, dysfunctional system in Washington, D.C. that frankly does not work for anyone in America. Clear, predictable, and fair guidelines and a pathway to citizenship for those who are undocumented, that's what we need in America. But if the president wants to wage a campaign of fear against innocent families, he can count us out because we won't lift a single finger or spend a single penny. And we won't be complicit in his effort to make America white again by re-engineering our legal immigration system. I say this because the Statue of Liberty doesn't say, give me your smartest, your richest, as well as your whitest. That's not what America is about. America is great because of our diversity. And in fact, it's the very essence of the American dream that people come here in search of a better life. Nowhere in this world can the youngest child of a single immigrant mother with a third grade education, a woman who worked her fingers to the bone, cleaning the homes in the wealthy enclave of La Jolla, with the homes with the ocean panoramic views of the Pacific Ocean, can grow up and become the leader of the California State Senate. And that is because of this great state, the state of California. Now, I want you to know that I have directed the former United States Attorney, the 82nd Attorney General of the United States of America, Eric Holder, to file an amicus brief in response to the lawsuit filed by the United States Department of Justice. United States Attorney General Jeff Sessions has targeted California because we refuse to help the Trump administration tear apart honest, hard-working families. Now, let me be very clear. This lawsuit is less about gangs and MS-13. And it's more about intimidating the state of California into conforming our values to the President Trump's inhumane and xenophobic immigration policies. But let me be very clear, because California will not be bowed, and we shall see Mr. Sessions in a court of law. 
And based on the United States Department's, Department's track record as of late in court, I can tell you this, that I like our odds. I like our odds very much. Because Senate Bill 54, the California Values Act, represents California's constitutional exercise of that sovereign authority. When I wrote Senate Bill 54, I wrote it in close consultation, again, with the former Attorney General of the United States. But I wrote it in response when I heard that the Attorney General, Jeff Sessions, wanted to deport the alleged 11 million criminal immigrant felons in the United States of America. Now, I think it's a safe bet to say that we all believe that such a number doesn't exist. We do have approximately 11 million undocumented immigrants in America, but we don't have 11 million undocumented criminal felons. We have a small fraction, and that runs the spectrum from a misdemeanor to a DUI to, yes, a criminal violent felony. But when you make such a remark, that sets the platform for mass deportation. In order to do so, I knew that ICE did not have the federal bandwidth to physically detain and actually deport that many number of immigrants. So what they would have to do is they'd have to be in a, actually commandeer local police departments as well as sheriffs throughout the country. And that's why I wanted to make it very clear that it's not about double taxation. And what do I mean by double taxation? When you pay your tax for those who reside in the city of Berkeley, or in the city of Piedmont, or Emeryville, or San Francisco, or south of us in Alameda or Oakland, we pay our taxes for our local police officers to protect and serve, not to enforce federal immigration law. I'm under no illusion that federal immigration law will be enforced by the federal immigration authorities. But again, the last thing you want is for our local police officers to collaborate and cooperate. We don't want crime increasing in our communities because we don't want families who are fearful of calling the police if they are a witness to a crime or even worse, a victim of a crime. And that's why I moved this measure, which was very, very critical. If Mr. Sessions is so concerned about violent crime, I would highly suggest that he focus on his own backyard. According to 2016 statistics by the FBI, violent crime is not just higher, it is significantly much higher in the state of Alabama than it is in the great state of California. And that's why I say again that we will do everything within our power to resist any attempt to undermine our public policies in the great state of California. Now, I'd like to take a moment to focus on an, ex an existential threat that is before us which is the issue of climate change. It's an issue that's near and dear to my heart. I can tell you this, we have passed the most progressive, far-reaching climate change policies, not in the state's history, but in fact, the entire nation. And as a result, our air is cleaner, our water is healthier, our kids are breathing easier and living longer. And this is not just about the environment, it's also about our economy. Coming off the worst recession since the Great Depression, we harnessed the power of the wind and created more than 500, 500,000 high wage jobs in the clean energy space, putting California workers on a pathway to a higher quality of life. Now I wanna put this in context because there are 10 times more jobs in the clean energy space in California than there are coal mining jobs in the entire nation. If in, fa in fact, in California, we have delinked and decoupled carbon from GDP, which means we have grown this economy and we have decreased our carbon footprint. That is an incredible feat to be the sixth largest economy in the world. Now, we have really built an incredible economy in the United States, the United States of America based on fossil fuels. That's a fact. But we also know scientists have given us the empirical evidence and the data that says this is not sustainable. We have to make a change because the economy as we know today will not exist. The environment as we know today will not exist and with continued carbon dioxide emissions into the atmosphere as well as other criteria pollutants, whether it's NOx, SOx, particulate matter 2.5, short-lived climate pollutants, methane, as well as black carbon, what our children breathe into their lungs every single day. And the number one reason for absenteeism in our public schools in California is due to asthma. 
but especially in those communities that are at the lowest economic strata, in low-income communities of color. That's why it's absolutely essential that you move policies that are not just driven by free market forces, but have intentionality and a sense of purpose, that are statutory, as uh, our dean just mentioned here just a few moments ago, making sure that 25% of all cap-and-trade auction revenues, and we're talking about not hundreds of millions, we're talking about billions of dollars, that it's a floor, that we invest those dollars in communities that are disproportionately impacted by both climate change as well as other criteria pollutants in low-income, uh, distributed generation, rooftop solar, investing also, too, in more parks and green space to sequester methane as well as CO2, investing also, too, in shade and trees, energy efficiency, reducing your energy load, and also, too, electric vehicles, because I don't believe that it will suffice if you live in Piedmont or in Palo Alto or in Southern California, in Santa Monica, or in Pacific Palisades or Brentwood, that if you have the financial wherewithal, you can purchase a home that's energy efficient or retrofit that home, have rooftop solar, have energy storage, have a charging station, and have access to a beautiful product, a ZEV electric vehicle. That's a good start. But if we're gonna meet our global macro targets, you have to democratize the benefits of climate change. If you don't do this and drive this policy-wise with intentionality, then the benefits of this, these technologies will never reach those who actually need it the most and those who are actually most vulnerable. So what I would submit to all of you is that we're in this together. Whether you live in the hills of Oakland or if you live in the flatlands in East Oakland or Fruitvale, we're in this one together. You have to move policy with intentionality and a sense of purpose. Short of that, the free market forces will not actually, you know, bring us together. It will actually exasperate even more so the inequities that exist today. So, if the president really wants to make the world's super energy power America, he should follow our lead. In California, we're not holding back the free market. We're, in fact, pushing it forward. We're disrupting the status quo catalyzing investment and competition, and charting a much more prosperous and sustainable economic path. Our commitment to strong environmental protections is a leading reason why California remains America's capital of innovation. And as you know, I introduced Senate Bill 100 last year to put California on a pathway to 100% clean, zero carbon energy by the year 2045. This bill is very much alive and in the state assembly and waiting for one final hearing so it can be heard on the floor for a vigorous, lively debate. Now, think about this. In the last 20 years, we've gone from 0% to 50% renewable portfolio standard, which means all of the electricity that we generate to turn our lights on, to turn our lights off, to cool our rooms when it's hot, and to warm our rooms when it is uh, cold to turn on that electric uh, coffee uh, maker, to turn on your washer, your dishwasher, your washer and your dryer, that takes energy, electricity. Half of that, by law, statutorily, now must be generated by renewable sources. The good thing is this, the investor-owned utilities have already signaled by 2020, two years from now, that we'll be 10 years ahead of schedule. The law in California is to renew, have renewable energy 50% by the year 2030. We will be 10 years ahead of schedule. And that means everybody, investor-owned utilities, as well as municipally-owned utilities, as well as CCAs. Anyone who sells you energy is by law going to have to generate half of that portfolio from renewable sources. And as a result, too, you create jobs and you have real economic growth, putting people to work. And that's why I believe we should go to 100% clean energy and send a signal to the rest of the nation as well as the world that in the sixth largest economy, where we have successfully bifurcated, or I should say de uh, delinked and decoupled carbon from GDP, that we're serious with our goals and we can grow the economy, reduce our greenhouse gases as well as criteria pollutants, we can reduce our energy load, we can put people to work, and at the same time we can offer a nice tax cut to consumers. 
Now, what do I mean by tax cut? When you open up that bill on a monthly basis, I want you to be able to pay less money out of your pocket so you have more money to invest in your own children, and your grandchildren, and whoever it is that you want to invest in, on yourself. And that is the goal of renewable energy. Now, I don't think that there's a politician, especially someone in my capacity, that's going to say to you, listen, I want to go to 100% clean energy. And as a result, I want to raise your rates, and I want you to pay more at the gas pump. No one's going to want to do that. But this is not theoretical. We're no longer abstract. Because the issue, as I stated at the Pontifical Academy of Sciences uh, last November in the Vatican, on this same issue, with a nice uh, number of professors from the University of California. You had one of your professors here, Dan, uh, as well as Ram from the University of California at San Diego, at Scripps Institute's, uh, Institution of Oceanography. The issue of climate change is not a scientific issue. It stopped being a scientific issue long time ago. This is a political issue because we have the scientific evidence that's indisputable and it's very clear. And in fact, I would submit to each and every one of you that the issue of climate change is not a democratic issue. It is not a progressive issue. It just happens to be that Democrats, I'll say this subjectively, believe in facts and science. We left the earth is still flat, you know, centuries ago. And because this drives our policymaking decisions, it informs people like me in the decisions that I make. So this is a political issue. And it is a leadership issue. You can win all the Nobel Prizes and be showered with the accolades that are very well deserved. But unless you take that data and you move it policy-wise, and you use the leadership and the political capital to put it on the line, to improve the human condition for the people that you care deeply about, it's all for naught. And that's why it's absolutely critical that policymakers, whether at the local, state, or federal level, work closely with their friends and their allies, especially in the University of California system. You are a wealth of information and data that really helps me. So I want to thank the professors that are here present here today because I can tell you this, that I would not be where I'm at today without all of you. And I'm not just talking about undergrad studies. I'm talking about as a leader of the California State Senate. I love surrounding myself with people who are infinitely much more intelligent than I am. And I'm like a sponge and I absorb because I have an insatiable appetite for curiosity. You have helped drive me as a result and as a result, we have secured some of the most far-reaching public policies that we can prove to other states, to other red states, that believe in the power of fossil fuels, that you don't have to continue to contaminate your groundwater, as well as your air, as well as send GHG into the atmosphere, that you can actually put people to work and grow an economy. Now, like I said, just the past 20 years, we've gone from zero to 50%. The first proposal was by a former law professor from Stanford Law, the Senator Byron Schur, zero to 20%. And when he proposed that, the naysayers and the predictors of the doomsday predictor said, you will destroy the economy, that utility rates will go through the roof, that in fact, you'll make poor people even poor, and gas prices will go through the roof. But quite the opposite happened. So another colleague, Joe Simidian, took it from 20% to 33%, and the same arguments were made. Well, I decided to take it from 33 to 50%. 50% energy efficiency, 50% renewable portfolio standard, and 50% reduction in the use of petroleum in the state of California. Now, we didn't get three out of three, but we got two out of three what I think is a pretty good deal nonetheless. Because by the year 2030, every single building, by the way, public or private, residential, commercial property, public university campuses, public hospitals, police departments, city halls, every physical structure in California has to be energy efficient by the year 2030. You reduce your energy load, you emit less, and as a result, you put people to work because these jobs are labor intensive 
They must be done physically on site. They can't be outsourced to a right to work state or offshore to Guangzhou, China, or elsewhere. You're putting Californians to work and growing the economy as a result. And those who pay that utility bill, whether it's a single mother, whether it's a school district, has less money, or I should say more money, on the table and pays less money to foot those bills. This is the opportunity that we have to create hundreds of thousands of good clean energy jobs, again, in, the process, in, in every corner of the state of California. The overwhelming majority of Californians support this goal. In fact, 76% of Californians, strong majorities of both Democrats as well as Republicans, support and want a 100% clean energy future. As the sixth largest economy on the planet, California can and will show the nation and the world that it's possible, that we can truly create a sustainable economy for our kids and for future generations. Now, in conclusion, I want to make a few brief observations. While it's certainly not help helpful to have a hostile Congress and administration in Washington, it won't be enough to halt the global momentum of clean energy. I'm still very optimistic. I'm still very optimistic about the future for a few key reasons. The first, as we already discussed, is the power of state and local leadership. The second, is a growing international momentum, even among some of the largest global polluters, like China and India. China sees the writing on the wall, and they're investing massive amounts of capital to try to take the lead as the world's clean energy superpower. It is unfortunate, but we do have a president right now who's literally serving on a silver platter, the global leadership mantle of clean energy to the Chinese. And the Chinese are more than happy to assume that leadership position, even while at the same time looking for coal and exporting coal to other developing nations throughout the world, chiefly Africa. Finally, and perhaps most importantly, is the incredible technological breakthroughs of recent years that, and their effects on global markets. Over 60% of all new energy generation in the United States in the year 2016 was from wind as well as solar. And the prices are falling dramatically. Clean energy is now cheaper in many parts of America than natural gas, even without subsidies. Many solar projects across the country are being pro priced at $1 per watt, down over 75% from the year 2011. And a growing number of politically conservative states like Texas and Oklahoma and Iowa now generate at least 20% of their electricity from the power of wind. As energy, clean energy costs continue to decline, demand will increase, employment will grow, and the political dynamic will shift. In the meantime, we will continue to use every single legal and political tool at our disposal to accelerate this process. With or without Washington, we're moving forward with our clean energy goals. It's unfortunate that the President pulled out of the Paris Accords of 2015 COP21, but I said, like I said to the New York Times and to NPR, with or without Washington, California is moving forward. And by doing so, we will continue California's incredible trailblazing tradition. It's that pioneering, risk-taking, open-minded spirit that makes us so special in such a unique state. We don't wait for the future to happen in California. We're constantly working to refine our present reality. And I'm under no illusion that California has its own challenges, whether it's water, whether it's poverty, whether it's transportation issues, whether it's also two clean air issues, like the Central Valley and the LA Basin. Although we have improved quite dramatically, we still have ways to go. But what's so exciting is that we're not naysayers, we're not in denial, that we're rolling up our sleeves and moving policies at all levels of government, and not just public policy, but nonprofit, academic, Folks coming together as one to move policies that, again, that improve the human condition for all individuals. Now, whether through technolo technological breakthroughs or moral transformations on the pressing issues of our time, leading the California State Senate and representing the most diverse and prosperous state in America has been the greatest privilege of my life. California is a shining example of what we can accomplish together 
and I do believe that we are America's future. It's more vital than ever before that we as a golden state remain America's exceptional example, a beacon of hope and opportunity in a very uncertain world. It's not just the rest of the nation, but the entire world is watching us very closely. We are unique, we are innovative, we are creative, we are immigrant, we are California, the greatest state on planet Earth. With that, I wanna thank each and every one of you for this opportunity to share a few words at this prestigious, prestigious talking event, and I look forward to taking your questions. With that, thank you very much. Thank you. So one of the things you, you spoke about in your address was higher education, and you've previously cited Assembly Bill 19, which offers the first year of community college free to all students as an achievement you're proud of in higher education funding. However, this bill does not change the funding situation for CSUs or UCs. Given your declared opposition to tuition hikes and the fact that UC currently spends less than uh, half per, the money per student than comparably ranked private schools, do you support legislation to increase state funding to the UC system? Yes. Uh, one, two, three, yes. Um, your reference to AB 19, uh, which was passed uh, last year, and what AB 19 does, is I want to give it some context, is that uh, in California this year, uh, 2018, if you attend a community college, um, whether you're a, a first year community college student out of high school, or if you're an adult, you know, returning back to, to uh, uh, receive uh, an upgraded skill to enter the, the workforce, re-enter the workforce, your tuition, uh, your first year tuition will be free. Uh, the idea in my mind is to set up the platform uh, to get two years tuition free and eventually get into the four year universities. You're absolutely correct. Um, I, I think, and I was talking to the students today uh, of the Cal Dems, that I, I do think that the legislative body, as well as the governor, has to take a really deep look at our, we have to look inside. And, and we have to measure and value what is our true commitment to quality higher education for California students. Uh, uh, speaking with the dean, I know that you know, since the 1990s when we had the first recession, and obviously it compounded even more so after the, the worst economic recession since 1929, our commitment has decreased quite dramatically. Um, I am in support, not just in opposition to the tuition, proposed tuition, tax hikes, but in more investments into University of California system. This is going to be part of a huge debate, you know. Um, in, in Sacramento, um, I would really implore all of you, you know, those who are faculty, those who are staff, those who are uh, alums, those who are uh, graduate students, those who are undergraduate students, to have your voices heard uh, with your representatives here. It's absolutely critical because I think that now is the time that we're, we're either going to put up or we should shut up, you know, as, as a legislative body. Yeah. You also spoke in your speech about immigration policy, and uh, specifically you spoke about SB 54, which significantly curtails information transfer between California law enforcement and immigration authorities. On, on a similar topic, California Senator Kamala Harris made headlines this week when she stated that she was opposed to abolishing the Immigration and Customs Enforcement, a proposal pro-immigration groups have increasingly been pushing for. Do you agree with Senator Kamala Harris on this issue? Um, she, she supports abolishing it? She does not support she does not. abolishing okay. it. Let me, let me put this in context. Um, I believe that every nation has a right to protect its own sovereignty, including the United States of America. The role that ICE has taken now has been weaponized and it's been politicized by an administration that has a very clear agenda, which was not focusing on violent, hardened criminal felons or MS-13 members, but rather picking up clerks from 7-Eleven on their third shift, uh, picking up women who were filing for temporary restraining orders, uh, fleeing domestic violence, picking up dreamers, picking up a father uh, in my district in Highland Park uh, in Los Angeles um, uh, who steps away from dropping off his daughter at elementary school or middle school, I should say. Now, abolishing ICE, I, I just heard this proposal for the first time last week. Um, I can't see myself supporting 
uh, abolishing uh, ICE, I can say this, is that we do have the right to protect our own sovereignty. We have a, a, the right to be humane. I don't like the direction of ICE today. I, I think that proposal that's on the table, uh, I, I think folks are better served to channel their energies to something that's realistic and that's, that's within reach as opposed to uh, living in the world of absolutes and going for the ab ab abolishment of ICE. Well, thank you so much for answering my questions. I think uh, Dean Brady will now take over. Right. Let's move to another area that's got us very concerned here at the university, and it's a general problem in California, but it's specifically a big problem for us here on the campus, and that's housing. Uh, we have about only 25% of our undergraduates who are housed on campus. We want to double that. Uh, we have about 9% of our graduate students. We'd like to double that and go beyond it. And in fact, also, it's a problem for our staff and for our faculty. So the housing prices in the Bay Area are becoming prohibitive and making it impossible for our students, for our staff, and for our faculty to actually afford housing. Uh, one thing that could help is if the state decided to help the university directly to produce more dorms and other kinds of housing for its students and perhaps for its staff and faculty. Uh, more generally, what would you do in the housing area? But it'd be nice to hear also what you might do specifically for the university because the university's capital funding has been ended by the state by Governor Jerry Brown and maybe this is an opportunity to bring it back. Yeah. Um, uh, Dean, I, I agree with you 100%, and whoever um, wrote the question, uh, I'm in agreement. Um, let me tell you what we did last year. And as I stated um, uh, during the course of my speech, it's not the end all, and it's not the panacea, but it is, I believe, one huge step forward, and it's just the beginning of what we need to do uh, as a legislative body, working closely with local government. We're all, we're in this together. Um, and we got to deal with the issue of nimbyism as well too. You know, if if if, if the state legislative, if the state legislature with the governor, you know, provides more capital funding for building, uh, for student housing and faculty housing, you know, we free up supply. You know, uh, whether it's in, in the city of Berkeley or, or elsewhere. So other folks who are non-students or non-faculty you know, members, perhaps workers you know, uh, here at Cal or just folks who live here, you have more supply. We have a, uh, we have a supply issue because the demand is gargantuan and so supply is limited. Now, we, uh, in November, we have a, um, a general obligation bond that will be before all of you. I negotiated the deal. It is Senate Bill uh, 3. It's a $3 billion general obligation bond. Uh, we want to leverage it with about five to six to seven billion dollars to have about $10 billion uh, when we sell it, uh, the bonds on the market. Uh, this is for affordable housing. It, I want to say it again. It, it is not going to be a, a gargantuan amount of money, but uh, leveraging $10 billion is, is, is a very good start. There's also two another measure, uh, which is by Senator Tony Atkins from San Diego. And it is a, um, uh, an increase, a $75 increase fee on uh, refis. Um, that will give us about $300 million in perpetuity. Uh, we can leverage that to securitize that. That's in perpetuity, so that's not a one-time deal. Uh, we couple that with the general obligation bond um, I'm working on a deal right now. This has to do specifically with homeless uh, population and those who are mentally ill. Um, I moved forward in 2015, um, not two, not 20, not 200 million, but $2 billion uh, for, it's called No Place Like Home. And what No Place Like Home is specifically is um, housing, for those mentally ill who are chronically homeless. Because in Los Angeles, and I don't know, if I can't say for here, uh, it made no sense when I saw mental health services providing psychotherapeutic services only for someone to go back and live in a, ted, uh, a, 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 a cardboard box or a tent. It made no sense at all to me. So you're taking cash money and you're lighting it up. And, and, and I had a meeting with the Los Angeles Police Department, the city attorney's office, the LA Housing Authority, 
the county social agencies, the mental uh, health agencies, nonprofit agencies, housing developers, a, a room of very smart people. And I learned a lot. And, um, but my conclusion was the following, that the right hand doesn't know what the left hand's doing. And the left hand has no clue what the right hand's doing. And they never communicated with each other at all whatsoever. And they had factionalism and territorialism. I thought it was crazy. And with my predecessor, Daryl Steinberg, we went to a restaurant, had a cup of coffee, and we just said, let's move $2 billion. We repurpose, it's no new taxes, personal income tax, no parcel tax, no sales tax, um, no gas tax. It's a repurposing of Prop 63, the millionaire's tax. And we're taking $2 billion. Now, the status is right now, it's being litigated. Someone is suing us right now. So I had a meeting with the governor, what's today? Tuesday, okay, Tuesday, I got it so long. Uh, Tuesday. I had a meeting yesterday with the governor. And what we want to try to accomplish is moving some language for the ballot initiative for June that would just clarify some language so the litigation would be moot, so we can push the $2 billion out as quickly as possible. Um, we have to streamline billing process too, mm -hmm. which is controversial at the local level because this is when we get the nimbyism and this is when we can go, hey, we need to deal with this crisis, but don't do it here. Not in my backyard. And this is where we need leadership too at the local level to say, you know, and I'm respectful of neighborhood councils and I'm respectful of, of preservation of character, you know, of, of, of communities and architectural designs, um, but we have to be in this together if we're gonna deal with this together. And, and, and um, I can say this is that on the housing crisis, this is just the beginning. Uh, look for more legislation, big legislation this year. Uh, you talked about how California leads the nation in, in climate uh, legislation. I think it's also uh, led the nation in terms of the implementation of the Obama health care uh, yes, bill. Yes. So Covered California, for example, has really done an extraordinary job of implementing that, that legislation. Uh, why not stick with what we've got instead of talking about universal health care? And if you want universal health care, how could we possibly fund it given our current economic circumstances? Okay, that's a good question. Um, one is we have the ACA right now um, through an executive order, obviously through the GOP tax plan, uh, the president inserted language that, that decimates the mandatory uh, uh, requirement for insurance, which means that the pool is going to bottom out. So it is his way of setting it up for a uh, failure. Uh, so the ACA eventually is gonna have uh, a little difficulty in the immediate future. And the question is, what do we do as a state to backfill, if you will, the subsidies that come from the federal level? Now, uh, one time we're dealing with housing issues, we're dealing with the issues of uh, proposed tuition tax hikes, in, in further investments in a, 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 a spectacular you know, public university institution like the University of California system. And then we're gonna have to deal with an issue if we get there, depending on the next presidential election, what do we do if the bottom, uh, uh, if, it, it, if it falls out on us? Uh, so I, I think on whether you're referring to single payer or Medicare for all in the proposal that was before us, Senate Bill 562, which passed uh, the state senate um, that is currently in the state assembly. Um, I cannot give you, whoever asked the question, a sort of forensic phys fiscal uh, 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 clear answer in terms of the funding per se. Uh, what I can say is this, is that under the Constitution of California that we had to move a bill out of the house of origin or it would die. And the idea was to move the bill out of the house of origin to the other house so we can continue to have the dialogue, the debate, so we continue to have economists across the spectrum. Whether you're an economist and you believe in universal health care that's a Canadian style, or a British style, or a Japanese style, or in Germany where they have universal health care system and they have the ability to pay a supplemental, you know, Cadillac, you know, um, type of uh, 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 um, uh, policy if you wish to do so in the, in the private sector. Um, so to have that debate and to have economists and have it keep, uh, to, 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 to keep going, um, I, I am concerned what happens with the ACA uh, right now because of this administration. 
uh, has politicized um, uh, healthcare. And, and let me say one thing. I was in Japan um, in July. And I don't know if anyone's been in Japan in July. <laughs> Holy mackerel. And I was warned, you know, but stubborn me, you know, the hottest period in my entire life, anywhere in my life. And uh, I had a meeting with the Prime Minister, uh, Shinzo Abe. And, but one of the, the, the most telling things was the meeting with the Minister of Health under Shinzo Abe, the party of the LDP, is that he looked at me and said, we have our universal health care system and the health outcomes are very good and our containment of costs are very good, uh, pharmaceuticals, everything. And we, we have a commission that looks at you know, our, our health care system and they make the modifications as necessary. He says, the problem with you in America that we don't have is that we implemented this universal health care system back in the 70s, early 70s, if my memory serves me correct. He says, and we did it because we wanted favorable health outcomes, we wanted to contain costs, and we wanted to make sure that every individual had access to quality health care, the young, the old, and everyone in between. So for us, it's not a political issue. It's a health outcome issue. He says, in America, you have politicized healthcare. It's not a healthcare debate. It's a political debate based on values and, and based on ideology and based on if you're on the left or the right, based on um, the personification, if you will, of the issue of race within the context of Obamacare. Because if you replace Obamacare with ACA, then there's a lot of folks who like it. You remove the three initials ACA and call it Obamacare, I don't like it. And that's what's happened in America as we have politicized greatly the issue of, of, of health care. So um, uh, I didn't really give a conclusive answer uh, to the issue of, of um, the universal health care in California. Uh, I am a supporter of universal health care. Uh, I am a supporter of Medicare for all. Uh, I think that Americans like their Medicare system, a system that currently works. There's very limited complaints and critiques. I don't know why we can't take something that works and incrementally change the criteria and start offering it to you know, other Americans. If we have a system that currently works, um, uh, we have to continue to pay into the system and, 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 and beware of attempts to privatize you know, for profit, you know, a system that currently works. So I'm on the record for Medicare for all, you know. California faces a lot of troubles, and, uh, but, and we've gone through a bunch of them, talked about how we might address them and so forth. And these troubles are exacerbated by having an administration in Washington, D.C., which is not helping us, and they haven't helped us with the new tax bill either, by the way, and we haven't even talked about that. What would you say if you were in Washington and you're trying to say, What's the case for California, and what's your, you seem optimistic about California, and I just want to hear a little bit about what your short speech would be in the elevator to a senator from Texas or something like that about what's great about California, how are we solving our problems, and why we should maybe be a model for the nation. Listen, I'd say everything, every stereotype that you think about California is true, you know, <laughs> and I'm proud of it. I'm incredibly proud of it, you know, because that's who we are. But the, the, uh, the, the elevator speech to that senator from whether Oklahoma or from Texas is, 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 is let's look beyond the, the ideology and the brands of left and right, and let's look at what works. And say, for example, our clean energy. We have proven that you can grow an economy, and we have proven that you can, you know, lessen, reduce your carbon footprint and put people to work. And that can work in a state like Texas, you know, uh, with regards to wind. And I know that Houston is the, the, the fossil fuel capital of, of, of the nation, and there's a lot of jobs that are dependent on the fossil fuel industry. There's no question about it. Uh, but when it comes to national security and our continued reliance, you know, on, on, on the fossil fuels and putting men and women 
in, 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 in harm's way by protecting seaways, you know, in volatile, you know, parts of the country. We're, we're sending a, American women and men into very volatile regions uh, because of this commodity. And we, can, we should demand freedom. We should demand freedom. Freedom from fossil fuel dependency, you know, and saving American lives and not sending them across, you know, overseas. And who wouldn't want to grow the economy? At the same time, have a tax cut that is manifested in that utility bill and have a job. And, and that's why politics matters. They're consequential. Because if I go into a room like this, and I, as a politician, sense economic anxiety, a sense of panic, insecurity, you lost your job. As a result of losing your job, you lose the social fabric of your household, you get a divorce, you lost your kids. Your self-esteem is shattered, your sense of belonging. I know that if, if I had lost a job, I know me. I, I identify myself with work. I, I, I would be, it would be very difficult for me. And you can imagine someone who loses everything and when a politician walks into a room and senses and smells that in economic insecurity and says, I know why you're in the situation that you're in. It is because of people that look like him over there. And this can be a great country again if we eliminate them. And therefore, you will rise again. And it preys on the fears of everyday Americans. It doesn't make a difference if you live in Pennsylvania or West Virginia or you live in the Inland Empire or Central Valley. You know, we're all Americans, you know, and this is the greatest country in the world. This is the greatest state in the world. And I know I deviated a great deal, you know, but, uh, but, but th this is important because economic growth, objectively speaking, and what we've accomplished in the clean energy space, I would say to my friends in, in Texas or Kentucky, you know, um, no one's buying coal. I know that folks are desperately looking for markets in, in Africa and in Latin America and certain southeastern nations, you know, but no one's buying coal. So what are you going to do? It's incumbent on you as their leader, as their duly elected, elected official, even if you're a Republican, to do everything within your power to make sure that you give every single child an opportunity to a higher education. You give that man and woman an opportunity to have a high wage paying jobs. And if we got it, we did it in California, you can do it in these areas as well too. You can grow the economy. You know, if, you, if it, it takes putting, you know, the red, white, and blue on top of the wind turbines, and so be it, you know? If it takes putting the red, white, and blue on the solar panels, you know, whether it's utility scale or distributed generation and patronizing, not patronizing, uh, pat uh, I'm making up the word, uh, you know, not patronizing, uh, not pandering either. If, 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 <laughs> not, not pandering. Well, I'm not pandering right now. You know, you know, you know <laughs> if, if, if making clean energy patriotic, you know, works, you know, then, then, then so be it, you know. Because it's about putting people to work and, and, and giving them a, 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 a sense of hope and a sense of opportunity. And when you have hope and when you have opportunity, the world is yours. No one can stop you. The world is yours. And you can't blame anybody else. And you won't allow a politician to scapegoat and pit one group against another. Because the unfortunate, sad reality is, is that Donald Trump is never going to deliver on his promises for these folks who deserved to have access to health care, who deserved to breathe clean air, who deserved to, to drink clean water, who deserved to have a high wage paying job. And, 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 and you know what? It is those politicians from those areas too that have knowingly understand what the implications are for the earth and for our environment and for the economy that have done nothing to position their respective communities through policy to position themselves to benefit from the largest of, uh, of a clean energy uh, uh, agenda. And that's why you have folks trying to undermine what we're doing in California in every imaginable way. So I said, listen, you want a job, you want to cut your taxes, you want cleaner air, do what California does. Make it, make it patriotic and you'll grow and you'll prosper as a result. And I hope you do it. And I hope you gain from it because we all deserve to win together. Well.
You know, the Goldman School is about trying to solve problems and to try to address problems, so I appreciate the fact that you have discussed problems and put forth policy ideas for solving them, and you've also reminded us that division and scapegoating is not the way to solve problems and not the way we want to move forward. So thank you for being here, thank and you. thank you for focusing on problems. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.